This week in eLearning 3.0, we're looking at resources and in particular, open educational resources. On Monday, I sent out a bunch of uh, resources about OERs, as they're called in the discipline. And yesterday we looked at some new methods for distributing open educational resources using the decentralized or distributed web. Today I have uh, Sukena Walji and Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams with me from the Center for Innovation and Teaching at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And here they are. Um, welcome to both of you to eLearning 3.0. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. In from Cape Town, where you've just informed me that you can see both the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean. Um, and <laughs> I'm in the cold uh, Canadian frozen wasteland where I have snow on the ground outside. But doesn't matter, we're connected through the magic of Google. Um, and uh, so we're able to communicate and uh, create uh, this open educational resource, which is a video on open ed educational resources. Um, so I wonder if, if you'd like to begin by giving us some background on the work that you've been doing in this area. Okay, well, for the last um, five years, um, between 2013 and 2017, um, a group of us at the University of Cape Town and a group at Wawasan University in Malaysia um, worked on a project called Research on Open Education Resources for Development. Um, the abbreviation reads ROER for D, but we choose, being from Africa, to pronounce it as RAW for D, like a lion. And RAW for D um, went about trying to understand um, the adoption and impact of OER in a range of countries across the global south. Now, this is not the geographic global south, it's more the political global south. So we had um, uh, the three, um, South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and um, Asia, and 21 countries overall, with um, lead researchers of the 18 sub-projects, and then in total about 103 researchers and research assistants. So it was a, a very big project, um, funded in fact by the Canadian um, International Development Research Centre, which is also partly funded by the Canadian government. So we were very privileged to have the opportunity to work um, on this with so many different people from so many countries, including as far afield as Chile, um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Mongolia, um, the Philippines. So we really did have a, a, a reach within the Global South. And perhaps I can just hand over to Sukaina um, for her role in the project. Okay, th thanks, um, Cheryl. So I was a part of the project and my role primarily was around um, the research communication side of things. Um, and so it was looking at how we could build this network, become sort of visible um, in OER research and also to develop a kind of communications um, strategy to so that the research would you know, ultimately have, have impact. I also was one of the researchers on one of the sub-projects, which was looking at OER and MOOCs. And at the same time, at that time over the three years, I was also um, the project manager of our institution's MOOC project, which um, also, um, we worked very hard to release our MOOCs as, um, open, under open licenses. And we were also researching how the educators who were making MOOCs, how their practices 
were impacted or influenced by by openness um, and the kind of MOOC format. So I had quite a sort of interesting role over the past few years, first looking at a, the network level in terms of communicating about open and OER, but also looking at MOOCs as a form of, of open educational resources and all the kind of implications um, following from that. So let, let's let's explore that a little bit. What's the relationship, would you say, between open educational resources and MOOCs? How does one relate to the other? So we we played with the title OER in and as MOOCs, and we we you know we we were critiquing that, you know, if you take a very um, you know you can have um, open educational resources within MOOCs. Um, you can make open MOOCs and, and, and what that means, you know, we, we critique. So we had our MOOCs hosted on the global platforms. So um, that meant in a sense that people still had to register. And at the time when we first launched, they were, they were pretty free. So you could have an argument that, you know, you were, you were creating a form of, of open educational resources or at least an open course. But you know, we were mindful that that is was a, a sort of a, a view, and that perhaps purists of open education resources would you know would say and did that you know that that the the conditions the particular conditions of an OER perhaps were not met. Um, so in terms of the relationship, I think it it is um, a very contextual relationship. Uh, um, you know, a, a disputable relationship, but certainly we were exploring in the research around um, what it meant for, for the MOOC materials to be created as open education resources. And we, it was interesting for us to, when, to, when we were, so when I say we, I'm talking about the learning design team in an educational technology center, working with educators and, exploring what the MOOC format meant in an you know in terms of open teaching and that licensing was was part of making their teaching more accessible and for me I think it's really what the objective of the MOOC makers was um, for if if their objective was to to have their teaching materials and their teaching opened out then licensing is, was a is a practical pragmatic strategy so i suppose i'm coming at it much more from a pragmatic sense around that and we were very surprised that that most of the well all of the um the MOOCs that we've released to have have um available under creative commons licenses and that we have seen um you know some reuse but obviously because it's you know you don't you can't really track reuse but certainly we have seen reuse in, in context and also from the point of view of the university of cape town as a global south institution we felt that um having an open approach to MOOCs um was very important that it, it felt um wrong to to have a MOOCs project, but then not make it as accessible as possible. I don't know if that answers your question, Stephen. Yeah, it does, although I want to pursue an aspect of that. And in this paper on dimensions of open research, which we were both involved in, you talk about the distinction between the ideological aspects of open and the, uh, the practical aspects of open or the operational aspects of open about MOOCs. I wonder if you can comment on that a bit. So I think one of the challenges that we faced was um, trying to understand um, an intention. That's why we kind of went for the word ideological. It was more around intent, that you had this intent to share. And what we were doing in this particular paper was in fact looking at um, uh, investigating open education resources in an open research fashion. So we were actually trying to make sure that our open practice of researching open was also open. You know, so kind of walking our talk. Um, and that we really needed to make a distinction between an intention of something being open, but also practically to know that sometimes open um, is not necessarily the ethical thing to do. 
at that point. So, for example, we had this great idea that we were going to um, have draft versions of the research available for everybody to see as they were writing. But we realized that that was, although we had an idea of open at that point in time, uh, because people were still trying to write and understand what they were gathering from their research, it was it was too early to make it open. So we actually then chose practically um, to withhold those developing um, book chapters until they were a little bit more ready. So, mm -hmm. so there was a there's like this intent, but it's actually got to be a little bit more measured. So we couldn't take a kind of purist view that you're going to do mm -hmm. everything in the open. And in fact, we were slightly worried because of our Global South perspective, where many of our researchers speak English as a third or fourth language, that actually opening up people's initial work would actually perhaps um, prejudice um, people um, looking at their work and thinking it's really not ready. But in fact, it was more about the competence in English per se than the actual content of what people were writing. So I think that's an example of how we did have the intent, but we had to be really pragmatic um, about the practical issues that we needed to address. So there's a very tight relationship then between the resources that are shared and the open educational practices that surround the sharing of that resource. But there isn't really agreement in the field, is there, about what we mean by open educational practice practices? No, it seems to be um, something that is, um, I think, as uh, Catherine Cronin says, continuously negotiated. But um, I mean, something that I was looking at a while ago and um, mapping the kind of development of the open education practices literature and moving and the disputes were around the kind of um, license and materials approach to open education practices where the, you know, the the OER is is the the primary um, aim, as it were, um, in terms of it depend OER dependent, and the kind of broader kind of open pedagogy and conversations around what it means to be open. And I think that debate is still going on, really. Um, although um, I think uh, you know you, new terms are emerging, like OER enabled pedagogy, for example, is one. Um, but I think um, in our project, um, one of the ways that Cheryl's conceptualized the open educational cycle is where the, the actual engagement with OER and the form of OER engagement is a type of open educational practice. And I think that's been quite helpful for us going forward in making sense of, of, of the relationship between open educational practices and OER um, as a product and a process. If you want to say more, Cheryl. Yes, so I think um, quite clearly the OER itself is a thing that we create. So it's always underpinned by some kind of open practice. Um, and I think initially we were focusing very much more on the product, on the resource. And perhaps um, what happened afterwards is that in fact we really needed to be interrogating the processes. So what I did way back in 2014 was to try for myself to get a sense of what I thought the optimal cycle of open education, uh, which included both the product, the OER, as well as the process, the practice. And I was interested in trying to disentangle what might be the relationships between an OER creation phase and an OER use phase and an OER adaptation phase. So I think, um, Stephen, the slide you're showing there now um, yeah. gives you an idea that for all three um, types of practices, whether you're trying to create, use or adapt, you implicitly have some kind of conceptualization process. And in fact, that's one of the most uninterrogated parts of this whole OER is how people come to think about how they put something together, um, what they consider um, the knowledge to be that they're drawing on. So that's something that I think um, we will have to look at. And you, you refer 
to the knowledge and different kind of epistemic stances and um, the colonizing of um, our knowledge in a more Western way at the moment in your uh, presentation earlier on today. Um, so that's the cycle then of trying to see how people create, ideally that it feeds back into um, the original conceptualizing stage and that people don't just use um, materials as a copy so that it doesn't get developed and otherwise it, it's, it's going to get stuck in time. And then the challenge of if you're adapting, where do you re curate that material? Where do you actually host it? And I think that's where you've provided us some really useful ideas of how we could be doing that with the interplanetary file system, if I've got the name right. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yeah, uh, so let, let's, I don't want to go into IPFS immediately, but I, I think that there's some, certainly something there. What I want to explore just briefly is, uh, how community feeds into the creation of OERs. Um, one of the things you mentioned in our earlier discussion was the, that people don't adapt so much as they copy and just reuse the copy. Um, do you think there's a relationship between the, the community creation of a resource and the likelihood of adapting it? I don't know if I'm asking that as clearly as I would like to, but. So if I understand it correctly, it's around, if you've got a community that are involved somehow in the creation, is there a likelihood that people will adapt because they know where it's from? Um, yeah, and something like that. Yeah. So we had some interesting um, work done in India on this one, and they actually built, um, uh, were built upon existing communities of practice within um, a teaching um, group actually organized um, by the province and had um, teachers co-develop materials and um, they they shared their materials a great deal and they even had a, a national a, a, a provincial portal um, for this particular group. And it was relatively easy, easy to upload the materials. But in fact, um, the researchers found that it, in fact they needed some kind of mediator to mm. um, upload them. And actually what the teachers themselves were doing was sharing the materials via um, email, was very common. Um, they had a listserv which was a fairly older technology, but they were still using that as a sharing mechanism. And even WhatsApp, um, they used for indicating that there were new materials available. So it's not that the teachers don't want to share. It's almost, um, we've got to look at certainly in India, they had the technology. It was more the digital literacies um, that were probably just not as um, sophisticated as they needed to be. And it was, created a bit of a barrier. So what are they using right now to create these resources? Do you know? Um, so in the Indian one in particular, they had a very strong focus on open source software. So virtually everything they developed, um, whether it was um, text or um, images, they would be using open source um, project uh, um, programs. Mm -hmm. So yes, I'm just trying to remember the one so that like they open used. Office. Like oh. open office. Yeah, open office was the was the one of mm -hmm. the one of the um, key texts in ch of choice. Um, but it was more. It was not that was the problem. It was the actual taking it from the format that they had it in and then uploading it onto mm -hmm. the um, repository that seemed to be the main sticking point. Um, but in Sri Lanka, um, they, we couldn't actually see what they used because what happened is that they did a lot of adaptation and then they took those materials because they had CC BY licenses, took those materials and often translated them into Tamil, for example, which is spoken in the north. Mm -hmm. And then 
put their redeveloped materials onto a password protected learning management system. So in a way, it was almost um, undervaluing the value proposition of an adaptation because those um, resources in Tamil might have been useful to people in other contexts as well, not just there. And of course, that has not, not become part of the OER resource mm -hmm. that we have, even though the practices were actually quite open. It was open within a closed community, not open um, globally. Now, do you think that was because of institutional or policy constraints or just because that was the easiest thing to do? You know, I think it was a little bit of both. It's, I think it's got to do with comfort. You know, for many um, teachers, this was the first time they were actually asked to do um, development mm -hmm. other than for their own classrooms. So the, the kind of collaborative working on materials was a first step. And then I think the process of sharing um, was just a little scary to be sharing um, with the whole world. Um, but it also was kind of there was a, a system uh, for the learning management system that was quite stable. And they mm -hmm. wanted to use something that everybody could have access to very easily. So it was a little bit of both, a little bit of um, kind of newness and then also the comfort of having a learning management system that everybody knew how to use. I think also sometimes there's the issue, certainly with, with the MOOC materials and putting it in a, a different place from the MOOC platform. That's been difficult to do, partly because there isn't an institutional repository at the moment that accepts video very easily. Mm. And that's just a practical constraint, but also because Often the MOOC materials have been updated, you know, somebody will add a new video or, you know, because it's a live course. So people are responding to things in real time. And so it's an issue of versions. So you have to worry about another version being somewhere. So I think that's, um, Stephen, why I was, I was interested in some of the affordances that you were talking about in terms of the the, cur the curation and the, re the finding, but also the naming of of resources that you were talking about in the uh, in the sort of you know, the sort of technical focused video around where the um, content addressable the care packages might might do and I'm, I was intrigued about that because I wasn't sure like one of the questions I had was I think you said somewhere you create a resource and then what it's called is dependent on what it is and that I was just intrigued by that and whether that that almost feels quite automated or automatic yeah, it, it would be. Well, I mean, it depends, right? Uh, on the system that they have available to them, how automated or not it would mm. be. In that video was something called the Beaker browser, uh, which would allow people to create and save resources uh, right in the browser. Of course, they're working in raw HTML to do that, so it might not be the easiest thing. Mm -hmm. um, but but right the uh, the address of the resource is based on the content of the resource, uh, so that would allow for for example a progression of different versions of the resource to be created and then referenced back to the originals all the way back to the very first version of the resource. Now, what what sort of impact do you think something like that might have? Um, on both your work and also the international community? So I think it would be really helpful because I think part of our challenge is, is for um, educators, both at a schooling level and in a high education environment, not every school or, mm -hmm. or um, in a province or state or even country has a repository where people can actually put things. So um, particularly derivative work. And so your the versioning, I think, is one of the, the strongest points. So I think that's it, it's the weakest link in our in that cycle. When we looked at what was actually happening, the weakest link was from the adaptation to the recuration. That was where things weren't happening. So anything where we can have something that anybody can put up 
because some of the sites, I mean, even MIT, you can't put back onto the MIT site something you've taken from MIT. Yeah, so, they won't give you that. <laughs> yeah, um, and the same here at UCT. I mean, we even had challenges with some materials that weren't developed by lecturers or students at UCT, and they said, no, it had to be um, a UCT staff or student member to be able to be on the institutional repository. So something that is kind of a institutional <laughs> would be useful. And secondly, having a standard for a nomenclature for OER, I still think is one of its biggest underbellies because, you know, like an ordinary article, I mean, you just put up an article that we wrote, wait, what, um, in 2006, it's still the same article. Um, it's really difficult to find um, the versions of OER and, and who started this OER and, you know, who's built on it and what is the, the latest OER developed by the original um, person or by subsequent people and in different languages. So we do need a level of nomenclature with a, quite a lot of detail that we haven't established. And I think what you've suggested is almost the closest I've seen to what could be used. So it's just going to depend, though, on the development of that, I guess, and making it accessible to people uh, worldwide in a relatively use usable fashion. Yeah, I mean, one of the concerns is about, and that's come out of research and generally working with, with people who want to create materials, um, uh, is around digital literacies. And at what point something is is just too difficult to get your head around or, or that the technical infrastructure isn't supporting that. And how, you know, uh, uh, because once what I've found is that People are certainly in the in our case. People were willing to put in the effort to create materials that were you know, could be openly licensed, so that you have to clear copyright. But they didn't want to get their hands dirty with licenses. You know, they didn't really want to understand or even talk about it. They were like, "You sort it out." You know, we really don't want to know. We're happy to do it. We're open sharing people, but the the, the sort of they felt the you know the tyranny of licenses and having to understand that and then the implications of it and then somebody asking them about it and then them not knowing exactly what they could do or not do with it. So I think, I mean, you mentioned I think somewhere in one of the videos, Stephen, that the system would do away with the need for licenses. Well, is that well, that's my hope. understanding? Uh, I was just wanting to. I was in, you know I was interested in that. I similarly hate licenses. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't hate really want to have anything to do with it. Okay, well, maybe hate's too strong a word. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's a lot of overhead there. And I've had the perspective right from the beginning of Creative Commons that the uh, creation of a licensing regime basically uh, also creates this whole, um, you know, resource as as commodity kind of perspective resources something that that's you know equivalent to a commercial product uh mm -hmm. that you would have to license right uh whereby uh, whereas i prefer uh what i think is represented in these uh, uh decentralized and distributed content networks where you create something you put it into the network and there it is and people can use it you don't worry about the licensing because it's just freely available in that network mm. the licensing is certainly a barrier because people don't understand it the other thing which um shows up quite a lot and, and people note this lack is in the actual learning design um mm. Because most teachers, um, and even especially lecturers at universities, have not necessarily been taught how to develop materials. So they will they will do a PowerPoint or two, but when they they'll say, "Oh, it's okay for my students, but um, if it's going to go worldwide, I'll have to put a little bit more effort in," which which may be a little um, counterproductive, mm -hmm. but nevertheless. Um, 
uh, the lecturers really worry about how to structure their materials. Um, and it seemed as though where people were developing um, quite a lot was where there was support institutionally for not just the technical part or the licensing, the legal part, but yeah. in the learning design part where people could ask for some support for that. So, but that means that you're looking at um, rather large groups of, of people mm. working at institutions or a network of teachers at a teacher center. Or projects. Or projects. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. One, one, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Now, I was just going to say that um, it did show that where there was institutional um, input or a government input or project input, that the materials were most likely to go through some kind of quality assurance process, but um, which is often the worry about um, OER. Um, so it just depends on what you take the OER to be, whether you're suggesting it's something you just put out there or something that particularly if it's representative of the institution, mm. um, that there is some kind of quality assurance process. But that's not happening with individuals' work. Sure, yeah. And actually, in my own case, I mean, I'm less likely to contribute something if it's going to go through some sort of quality assurance mm. process. Not because I don't like quality, I do like quality, but you know, I don't like the idea of somebody saying to me, well, uh, your resource just doesn't deserve to be shared. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, th I think so one of the uh, one of the attributes of what they call the peer to peer web, which is uh, what Beaker and this whole distributed system is all about, is that you can get examples of previously created work, in, including, you know, for example, a well-designed instructional materials, and actually look at the source of those and then create a new resource based on that source, in, a, in effect scaffolding the existing resource and creating your resource based on that design. Do you think that would be helpful? In fact, we have examples of that being done um, in Africa. Um, the TESSA project, I uh, don't know if you're aware of that project, no. was run from the Open University um, at the, in the UK. Um, Frida Wolfenden, who was also one of our researchers, um, she's been working on that project for a number of years across um, African countries, and they explicitly um, encouraged um, academics and teacher educators to use patterns and uh, types of materials so that they weren't necessarily copying a resource, but they were looking at um, the structure of a resource. And um, that seems to be pretty helpful. And people, in fact, are doing this all the time with OER and with anything on the internet, mm -hmm. to be honest. They're using the they're using something as an example, um, and then deciding what they want. But they're not necessarily um, saying, "I looked at this resource," um, and attributing that. Um, so by the time the res their resource is created, it may have come from many different examples that they've decided to draw upon. Uh, no, that that sort of process makes me think of people like Grunya Canal and uh, Diana Loderlard. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think if we're looking at how your um, intended system can be supporting, I think there are possibilities. And I think just to reinforce, I think what you were saying earlier, it's just got to be a really easy interface. So it may just be a little time until this technology is um, made a little bit more user friendly. Um, so that you don't actually have to get your fingers in the cookie dough in the back end to actually name something, um, that it's done yeah. relatively easily, um, then I think we're probably, you're probably onto a good thing. 
Well, I think so too, if I can say that uh, for myself. Uh, of course, it's a good thing that's been tried a bunch of times before, but we just haven't had, well, first of all, the desire to do it, and secondly, the technology to do it. So maybe this time. Because mm. I think if there's one thing that we know from this research project overall, that the technology needs to be the enabler but just providing the, the mm. technology by itself is actually not going to create the change. So structurally, the, the infrastructure, I mean, we have um, challenges just with power supply, um, intermittent power supply. I mean, even in South Africa right now, they're threatening uh, power outages because of actual poor maintenance of the, um, the mm. coal reserves. Um, so in many instances, those things are um, challenges to just get going, but they're not sufficient in and of themselves. What we see is the, the necessity of the community of practice and some kind of reward. It doesn't have to be financial, um, uh, or maybe you want to call it recognition for the work people are doing so that there is a longer term incentive for them to do it because um, creating OER takes time. Yeah. Um, and even, which is the, one of the biggest challenges is, is the use of images. Um, and although there are a number of images that are available online, um, partly people are moving to a sort of freemium model so that there are fewer and fewer um, images available for people to use that are in a kind of style that uh, will make the resource look like kind of as somebody intended rather than kind of one little picture from there and one little picture from there, which makes it, it, it doesn't necessarily help, it kind of it may distract. So I think one of our challenges is to be providing um, sets of really useful um, images, icons mm -hmm. that have a permanent um, license um, and not to have them available for a while and then they disappear. Um, uh, or the company just um, decide that they can't do this anymore. So it's. Those are some of the tricky parts for OER development and adaptation um, for lecturers and educators. So that's one of the nice things about what Internet Archive is doing uh, by attempting to put all of its resources into this distributed web effectively making them permanent resources that anybody can use. And so doing something like that as an OER project, rather than putting them in a repository, putting them into the distributed decentralized web might be a way of making sure these images are always available for use by open yeah. education projects. Yeah. And I suppose the other, the other thing, um, and you might have a view on this, Stephen, is around as materials and courseware becomes more digitized and you know subject to analytics and you know an interactive, then you've got you know the market and the private sector playing a role. And so you know one of the th conversations has been that that open OER has to also be you know that kind of the same kind of affordances and, and possibilities because we you know we would have um, educators and lecturers here saying but you know I want to buy this because it comes already packaged and then I don't have to you know do my own marking and 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 therefore you then get tied into a kind of more commercial relationship and I think it's, it's also a factor going forward in terms of um, you know materials or creation of yeah, it's an interesting question because when a resource is shared on the distributed web, right, you, it's not really something that you can turn around and resell because it's available on the distributed web. 
although there may be commercial models around that that uh, I haven't thought of yet. Uh, certainly, the distributed web ties in in many ways to digital currencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum. And uh, there's a project called Civil, uh, which is uh, an internet coin, a digital coin project intended to fund journalists. Uh, you know, it just basically is a way of rewarding the content, uh, the contribution of content with these coins. So possibly there's uh, an application there. Do you think that would satisfy what you were uh, addressing here? About recognition? About reward. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I think it partly, um, I think that would be important, um, particularly if people, for example, where we've had some success here at the university is where we've had literally small amounts of funding, um, like $1,000 um, to for a, a a lecturer to be able to hire a student assistant to actually work through their existing PowerPoint presentations and replace um, the proprietary images that they've just nicked from the internet and find um, uh, a Creative Commons um, versions thereof. And that has been quite successful. Our challenge is the maintenance of those materials you know they do it once mm -hmm. and they do it yeah. perfectly and then the next year round there isn't time so then they nick another um image from the internet and so yeah that is that is a challenge but i want to raise something a little bigger Stephen, and this is something that perplexes me a lot and that is around the kind of meta level organization so mm. Um, we've got all these little resources being shared, but one of the key challenges teachers um, seem to um, highlight is they're not sure where this resource fits um, and how to group these resources and levels of difficulty and um, even as they refer to it as curriculum aligned. So there's there's kind of an, another layer, um, which I think is probably the most tricky one. I don't have an answer, um, but um, because otherwise just a collection of a whole lot of things doesn't actually make a substantive piece. Um, people have got to collect it. Unless, um, unless it is a course. Unless itself. it is a course itself, but, but yeah. yeah. Um, so it's the kind of the range of OER from the individual graphic right to the the so the sort of little loop. OER and the bigger OER, OER that I think Martin Weller talks about. And um, that yeah. that for me still seems to be a kind of intractable problem at the moment. Um, I'd really like your thoughts on that. Yeah, of course. That that was the problem that they tried to solve originally with learning object metadata. Mm -hmm and you describe all of these different properties in the metadata. The problem with learning object metadata is people use seven out of the 87 fields to name it and maybe describe it or something like that. Uh, my first reaction on, on hearing what you said is uh, to think that, well, these resources are going into this distributed web as part of a graph. Um, and a graph is basically a network of, of connected resources, but also connected concepts, people, etc. So for example, in the graph, uh, especially in a peer-to-peer -peer graph, you would have nodes in that graph for individuals. So right away, a resource would be connected to an individual and that gives us uh, at least the beginnings of attribution. But we could also have nodes representing, for example, the levels where it was used, the subjects where it was used, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, and, and form this richer picture. And my take, because you know, with, with graphs, uh, there's, there's really two approaches. On the one hand, 
people get this this network of resources and then they try to use artificial intelligence or something to create this network of connections between the resources and that's a useful thing but on the other hand uh we have this network of resources and we have this rich information about actual use of these resources by people in the real world mm -hmm. and to me that's a better source of information about that's something that's almost impossible to do with repositories and learning management systems but if we're using and associating these resources in a distributed web, then that's almost a property of the environment where they're being used uh, as it is. At least that's my thinking on this. Mm -hmm. I had some inkling of that when I saw the graphs um, that you were that you spoke about in your video. Um, mm -hmm. I suppose I was I'm kind of kind of working my way into it to see how it might work. Um, but that's that I think would be the the holy grail if we could say that yeah. if we could get that right. Um, or maybe to have some way in which um, like connections has this the kind of view that you take. It's got another name. Um, oh wait. yeah, it's uh, the Rice University thing. What do they yeah. call it? Oh, anyway, it's, it's like it's like a selection. So there could be something like that because one of the challenges that um, the teachers expressed was there is so much out there that they don't know where to look um, and in many instances what they were asking for was a set of materials that were curriculum aligned and then um, a few extra materials but that somebody else had already said this is useful for you to use so that they had a, a kind of pre-selected yeah. range to work mm -hmm. within because they were um, worried about how much time everything took so the the time that this took was one of the, the biggest issues mm -hmm. that came up across all the studies um, and the kind of dead ends that people got to and you know what we what we talk about is going down a rabbit hole um <laughs> trying yeah. to find so materials the there's an opportunity cost of, mm. of the effort required especially and in, and also the other issue around in our context is sort of locally relevant or culturally relevant curricula mm. um and, and the time it takes to, to to develop and create that as opposed to just starting from scratch yeah, so th this is what Wiley called the reusability paradox, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. the more specific the resource is, the less likely it is that yeah. you can resource. Yeah. But the but, more general yeah. the resource is, the less useful it is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it is um, definitely a paradox. Yeah. Connections, by the way, is now called OpenStax. I looked it up. Yes. Right, it's right. OpenStax. Yes, I did know that. Sometimes this yeah. old brain of mine doesn't work so well. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've gone over our half an hour by quite a bit. So I think I'm going to, uh, and this is probably a good spot to wrap it up on. Um, thank you so much for joining me in this discussion and, and contributing to our course in such a meaningful and insightful way. Um, I know that uh, people in the course will appreciate it. We've had viewers on this video live throughout, so we weren't just talking to each other. But even <laughs> more to the point, it'll be recorded and uh, become an open educational resource in its own right. Maybe one day even uploaded to the D-Web, although I'm not sure how to do that. For the <laughs> although there is a thing out there called PeerTube, which I need to investigate. So you know, it is. I'm sort of afraid to. But we'll leave that to you. Yeah. So thank you very much. And uh, for those of you watching uh, eLearning 3.0, we're going to continue on tomorrow with a discussion that of one of the concepts that was mentioned during this discussion, the idea of care, content, addressable resources for education, and of course, related concepts like care packages and care net. And uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, will find it interesting.
Uh, although <laughs> at this point still, because we're in early days, still fairly complex. But again, as always in this course, the idea isn't to know everything from top to bottom. The idea is to learn what you're comfortable with and leave the rest to someone else. So uh, <laughs> on, behalf of, <laughs> uh, on behalf of Sukena and Cheryl and myself, uh, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. I'm Stephen Downs. <laughs>